thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. Uh, I was just saying to uh, a Tory that I live in Kingston, just outside London, and when I go to the Odeon Cinema, I don't see nearly so many people. <laughs> I'm really quite impressed that my subject should cause such, so much uh, interest. I've got to admit, uh, however, that I'm not a stranger to Norwich. Uh, I've visited uh, here several times because my daughter lives here uh, and I've spent quite a few uh, evenings babysitting uh, and dog sitting. I've even, believe it or not, visited Norwich Castle and Norwich Cathedral. And the nearest I've been to uh, uh, this university is when we visited with my wife, we visited Sainsbury Centre. And it was very interesting. I don't know what I saw there, but I do remember. <laughs> I do remember we got lost. I just hope I'll be able to get away today. <laughs> I visit schools uh, on a regular basis, and I talk about the Holocaust. I talk about the Holocaust because I was born in 1939, uh, and I was born in Paris, and I managed to survive uh, the Nazi occupation by being hidden by two non-Jewish ladies. And I will, uh, I will try and describe as much as possible as to what happened to me. I do like to talk to JSOC. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Birmingham, JSOC, because it gives me the opportunity to say something about anti-Semitism, which has become quite a political uh, subject at the moment. Uh, when I talk to schools, I tend to co uh, concentrate on the dangers of racism. Uh, and as we all know, racism is still with us uh, and still very, uh, very dangerous. I'm here, I could be at home watching daytime TV, but I'm here to represent 11,400 Jewish children under 16, who were murdered, they came from France, who were murdered for the only reason they had been born Jews. Uh, I've also got to mention that 11,400 from France, altogether during the Second World War, during the Holocaust, over a million children under 16 were murdered. What a loss. Edmund Burke, a philosopher, MP, uh, an important character, once said, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Uh, I understand other people were supposed to have said the same thing, but there is no doubt that uh, this is a lesson that's got to be learned. Uh, I say it's got to be learned because uh, I came from France, I was born in France, and now, the French Jewish population are feeling very threatened. There have been shootings, they've been treated very badly, uh, they're very worried. Uh, and uh, this is something that has got to be remembered. History does have an unfortunate uh, habit of recurring, of coming back again. When I talk, I divide my talk into three parts. First of all, I talk about the general uh, Holocaust in France during the, during the Second World War, and I illustrate it with a, uh, with a film, which I hope will be shown. Then I will describe how I managed su to survive. Uh, I was hidden by two non-Jewish ladies, and I spent the whole war as a child, as a very young child, uh, which is why I'm fortunate enough to be here today. Then, I want to conclude the talk by saying why I find it very important to talk on that subject at a time, alas, racism is rearing its ugly head yet again, uh, which is something that tends to happen during uncertain times, uh, when things are getting a bit tough. Uh, uh, I'm afraid that people tend to uh, 
paper minorities to vent their anger or their frustration. Then, uh, just to conclude, I hope there'll be quite a few questions. Uh, you all look very intelligent. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. Just quickly as an introduction, France during the Second World War. The German army <coughs> entered France in May 1940 and a month later they were in Paris. And obviously I wasn't aware of this, but as a one-year-old I was in great danger because the Nazis were going to murder children, old people, <coughs> young people and even babies. France was divided into two portions. You'll see, uh, you will see a map later. The northern part was governed by the German forces, and the, uh, the lower part, the southern part, was governed by the Vichy government. I don't, perhaps some of you have done this sort of history, but the Vichy government was led by somebody called Maréchal Pétain. And Maréchal Pétain was a fascist, he was a racist, and he did everything that the Germans told him to do, and possibly even more. At the time, there were 300,000 Jews, uh, around 300,000 Jews in France, which constituted less than 1% of the population, but they were considered a great danger for some reason or other. 78,000 were deported from France, including my father, a lot of them Jews that were trying to escape uh, uh, Nazi Germany and East, uh, Eastern Europe. And at the end of the war, only 2,500 returned. 2,500, which means that 95% of these deportees were murdered. Why were they murdered? They were murdered because they were Jews. And of those, as I said, 11,400 were children under 16. Uh, some of them who could have been here uh, today if they had survived. In October 1940, racial laws were initiated. Racial laws meant that Jews uh, they couldn't have a lot of jobs, they, were, uh, they couldn't be uh, in politics, they couldn't be uh, civil service, uh, in hospital. There were a lot of jobs uh, that they couldn't do, so earning a living during that period was going to be extremely difficult, particularly in view that there's been a lot of propaganda. I may mention propaganda again because uh, propaganda is very important. In fact, I don't know whether you would agree with me, but even what, you, uh, what you're hearing now uh, on the internet, uh, on the media, some of it tends to be propaganda. One has got to realize that some of the material that you read or hear, some of it may not be actually true. Now, I'd just like to show a short film about what happened in France uh, during the Holocaust. I had a bit of trouble trying to get this. Let's have it work. I just want to stop it now because there isn't that much left anyway, but it describes uh, uh, in not so much in detail, generally, what happened in the Channel Isles because the Channel Islands were occupied by the German forces. In fact, the Channel Islands were the only part of the British, uh, Commonwealth of British, of Britain, that was occupied by the, uh, by the Germans. But now I want to uh, describe, or I want to say what happened to me. How did I survive? Interestingly, there was something about Oscar Groening uh, the German person there, uh, and I don't know whether you, you, uh, uh, you follow the news of the last year or so, but it would appear that Oskar Groening was taken in by 
the German forces a couple of years ago, and he was tried and he was convicted. Uh, but he appealed against a conviction and he, uh, he died while he was uh, out of prison. Uh, but justice was almost uh, done. My mother and my father had come from Austria in order to escape the Nazis. And I was born in 1939. We lived in a place called Passage Brady. I presume some of you have been to France. <coughs> Nobody's nodding, but I'm sure many of you have been. <coughs> and Passage Brady is in the Dizian arrondissement. It's near, uh, it's quite uh, near to, uh, to Gare de l'Est. And we lived on the fourth floor of an apartment. In May 1941, my father was taken in, uh, on the 14th of May in fact, and he got what they called the billet vert, rafle du billet vert. This is a rafle du billet vert. And it says on it, Paris, le 9 mai 1941, Monsieur Ladenheim, Passage Brady, number 90 Passage Brady, is invited to se present, is invited to present himself in person, accompanied by a member of his family, accompanied by a member of his family, or d'un ami or of a friend, le 14 mai 1941, at 7 du matin. And he had to go to Rue Jopi to examine de sa situation, to examine his situation. Prière de menir des pièces d'identité, bring identity papers. La personne qui ne se présenterait pas aux jours et aux heures fixées, the person who doesn't turn up, s'exposerait aux sanctions les plus sévères, will be uh, expose himself to sanctions, the most severe sanctions, signed Commissaire de Police. So this is where my father, a man of 31, had to turn up according to the Bieber, but he didn't know, and nobody knew that once you, he turned up, or once the people turned up to this destination, they were never going to come out again. And uh, my mother uh, must have been there, and I was almost certainly there, and interestingly enough, my mother was pregnant. She was going to give birth to a baby two, uh, two weeks later. My brother was born on the 24th of May, but she obviously saw her husband disappear de Rue Jopi, and he was never going to come out again. Uh, for a woman uh, like my mother, who was in her early 30s as well, uh, who couldn't speak French particularly well. She was, uh, uh, she'd originated in Austria. Uh, it must have been a very traumatic experience. My father was sent to bonne la Rolande, and this was a description of bonne la Rolande on that clip. Uh, and bonne la Rolande is about two hours away south of Paris, and every year on the, four, on the uh, second or third weekend in May, I usually go, sometimes uh, with my wife, sometimes with, my, uh, with one of my daughters, but I usually meet other people similar to me, people who lost their fathers, their mothers, uh, their siblings, uh, and there's a, a reunion, and there will be another one this year. <coughs> this meant, as I say, that my mother at that point was left alone, uh, unable to speak particularly good French, or any French as far as I know, uh, spoke German, she didn't have a husband, she had a, very, a small child, me, and she was about to give birth to a baby. A very, very traumatic uh, experience. But at the base, at the ground floor of these apartments that we lived in, in Passage Brady, there used to be, and I think there still is, what they call a concierge. <coughs> and the concierge was very important because when the police turned up and they would ask, avez-vous des juifs, have you got Jews? 
in your apartment, she could say, I, je ne sais pas, I don't know, or no, there isn't. Or she could say, we, we got Jews. Uh, and it was to, you, to her advantage to say yes, because as soon as the women and the children were taken away, the concierge could go up to the apartment and take whatever she or, or he wanted. They could raid the apartment. Fortunately, somebody must have said to my mother, they've taken away your husband last year, they're going to come to you for you this year. And sure enough, in 1942, women and children, mainly women and children, were rounded up and taken to the Velodrome d'Hiver. When I got to this reunion at Bon La Roulande, now, one of the time when uh, I went there, I picked up a couple of uh, pamphlets, and one of them was a letter that was written by one of the internees at Bon La Roulande, who had sent a letter to his wife. And it's, he sent it to, uh, to his wife, and it's headed Bon La Roulande, 16th of July, 1942, and he writes, Ma chère petite femme et mes chers enfants, my darling wife and my darling children, on est venu nous dire, they have come to tell us que nous partons aujourd'hui pour l'Est. They're taking us away to the East. He didn't know where, but the East went Auschwitz. And he concludes this by saying, Ne crée rien, ma chérie, don't worry, my darling. On ne tuera pas tant de monde. They can't possibly kill so many. But they did. And this, this man was sent away on convoy number six, and his name was Joseph Glazer. Uh, my father was on convoy number five. I thought I'd also uh, read from another pamphlet, <coughs> this one here, and there's a picture here of a girl, of a young girl called Aline. She must have been four, and it's, it says, Aline Corrin, née à Paris le 31 août 1939. She was born in August in Paris, in August 1939, avec sa mère. She was arrested with her mother on the 16th of July, 1942. She was younger than me. Toutes deux, both of them, sont internées dans le camp de bonne la -Rolande. Both of them were interned in bonne la -Rolande. Elles font partie du convoi numéro 25, they're part of the convoy number 25 du 28 août 1942. Destination Auschwitz-Birkenau. Comme tous les enfants du convoi, like all the children of this convoy, Aline est gazée dès son arrivée. She was gassed as soon as she arrived, or as they arrived. Uh, these were convoys that were about. Uh, 85, 86 convoys with around a thousand people in each convoy. A convoy was a train for, uh, for animals, to, uh, to carry animals. There were certainly no uh, uh, toilet facilities, no seating facilities. In the summer, it was absolutely stifling hot. You can imagine the children crying for two days on the way to Auschwitz. Just. Uh, just a little bit more on this, uh, on this subject, and it says, A partir de fin juillet 1942, from the end of July 1942, les mères sont violemment séparées de leurs jeunes enfants. The mothers were violently separated from their children, et déportées avec les adolescents, and the mothers were deported with the ad adolescents, by four, quatre convois, by four convoys, qui part directement des gares de bonne la Hollande pour les camps d'Auschwitz. The trains went directly to Auschwitz. 
les enfants, the children, reste so they were left alone. You, can you imagine the tears, the distress of these children? They had their mothers taken away. <coughs> Livrés eux-mêmes, they were left by themselves avec une détresse physique et morale absolue, absolue, in absolute distress. À la fin du mois d'août, at the end of August, ils sont à leur tour déportés via Dorancy. The children were sent via Dorancy to Auschwitz-Birkenau. Ils sont tous gazés, they were all gassed, dès leurs arrivées, as soon as they arrived. And there's a picture at the back here of a lady, of a woman with four children, woman and four children. And it says here, family glazer, tous les cinq, all five, ont été internés à bonne et déportés par le convoi numéro 20. They were deported, convoy number 20, aucun n'est arrivé, et non, aucun n'est retourné. None of them came back. They were all gassed. I mention this because I was fortunate enough that my mother took me and my baby brother, she took us into hiding. And she took us into hiding to the north of Paris, to Rue Pouchet, which in, is in the 18th arrondissement. And we stayed with a monsieur and madame Lauriche in number 24 uh, Rue Pouchet, but while we were there, my mother had a breakdown. She had a breakdown from which she never recovered, which was uh, fairly understandable in view of the fact she'd lost her husband and she was left with a baby and a child and she couldn't speak the language. Uh, and they eventually took her away to a psychiatric hospital. <coughs> Monsieur and Madame Lauriche, realizing that hiding two Jewish children was going to be a dangerous, it was going to be something very dangerous because there were instances of the people who were doing the hiding taken out into the streets and shot by the Nazis there and then. They suggested, they weren't keen to hide me, they, uh, you can well imagine, they were scared, which is understandable, but they suggested that I would go down the road to number 18 Rue Pouchet about 100 meters down the road, and to go to the third floor where there were two sisters, Olga and Esther Mazzoli, two French ladies of Italian origin, and that I should ask them to take me in, which is what I did. And fortunately, it happened. I actually did this, and from what I can gather, from what they told me uh, many years later, there were tears. In fact, I can remember Olga saying, you know, you couldn't reach the doorbell, so you bell, so you kick the door. You can imagine the tears. Uh, I've got to add that uh, there must have been loads of tears, but I don't remember. I don't remember anything uh, about tears. It's interesting how the mind just eliminates that sort of uh, traumatic experience. I stayed with Olga and Esther Mazzoli. They kept me during the war. Uh, I was four then. And they kept me right through to 1945. And I became, with them, what they called a hidden child. Uh, there are other uh, hidden children, but some of the hidden children were hidden in attics, like Anne Frank, some of them in cellars, some of them in forests, some of them in convents. Some of them were really quite unhappy, and I've got to admit that I was very happy because Olga and Esther treated me as if I was their son. I was very happy. In 1945, my mother was released from the psychiatric hospital, and my mother turned up and took me and my brother, she took us back to, uh, to Passage Brady. Again, it must have been traumatic. Uh, I've been with Olga and Esther Mazzoli, uh, who treated me like their child. I was spoiled, <coughs> spoiled rotten. And I was going away with my uh, biological mother, who I could hardly communicate with because she couldn't speak French. 
I stayed with Olga Mazzoli for a short period. My brother stayed with one of her boyfriends. And in 1948, my aunt, my mother's sister, came from Manchester and took, uh, and took us to Manchester. Uh, again, not a pleasant experience, uh, particularly in view of the fact that my aunt and uncle, uh, they were extremely uh, religious Jewish uh, Orthodox, uh, and to be quite frank, this didn't go, uh, didn't go along with this. So it was uh, a difficult time for me, and eventually I was educated in Manchester, I went to school, and eventually I went to university. I went to Manchester University, where I studied dentistry. Eventually, I came to London, and in fact, I've been living uh, in Kingston for about 40 years. I got married, I've had three children. In fact, my wife is here. I don't think she's gonna say a few words. <laughs> She will afterwards. <laughs> I've got five grandchildren, and when I see my grandchildren, I think to myself how different their situation here. Uh, I have uh, uh, three grandchildren living just very close to Norwich. In fact, the oldest one is now at Birmingham University studying medicine, fourth year. Uh, and I thoroughly enjoy visiting them. Uh, and I understand that tonight uh, I am going out with the family to celebrate my grandson's 18th birthday. Just would like to show a few, uh, a few pictures here. This is France divided up into two portions. The upper part ruled by the Nazis and I don't think you can see, but it does, there's a Star of David, it says Bon La Roulande, that's where my father was interned for a year before he was sent to Auschwitz. The lower part is governed by Maréchal Peter, and there's an area on the lower right, uh, on the eastern part, which is yellow in colour, and that was governed by the Italians, but the Italians weren't going to do what the Germans said, they felt that putting old people and children into convoys to take them to their death was really not, not on. So in 1943, the, uh, the Nazis told the Italians to get out, and they took over that area. Now, I'm not quite certain how to change this. A French policeman saluting a German soldier and this, as no doubt you all know, is Arc de Triomphe. A boy can't be more than five or six, I would say six, with Juif uh, on, uh, on his chest. As I say, uh, not treated particularly well when they did turn up to school, as you can well imagine. <coughs> Ici Maison Juif, this is a Jewish house, a Jewish shop, don't buy here, which meant that earning a living was going to be very difficult between about 1940 to 1945. Uh, very, very, very difficult. These were Jews who were sent to the camp, led by a French policeman. Uh, uh, a few years ago, for many years, the French government said, no, we've we got nothing to do with this, not our fault. But maybe six, seven, eight years ago, the French government uh, under uh, Jacques Chirac said, no, we acknowledge that we were at fault here. There was an element of mea culpa. And as a consequence, the people, the children of the people who were taken away have got a pension. I'm one of them. I think you saw a picture in the film, a wife kissing her husband and a child looking on. They were not aware of the fact that uh, a few days later, the men were going to be taken away to their, uh, to their death. I think, I think, 
I can remember being there at Bon Lago Land, but oh, I must have been about four, three or four. I'm not quite certain. This is a book that I used to bring with, but any, uh, on every page of this book, there's a picture of a child who was sent away and didn't come back. But altogether, there were 11,400 or so, and this is one of them. And this one, this is a very thick book, you can well imagine, and uh, in the early stages, I used to bring it with me, but it's coming to pieces, so uh, now I'll just bring a picture. And this girl, she's called Annie Horowitz. She says on a Jew, Jewess, and she was born in Strasbourg, and it says across, étranger surveillé, a stranger to be observed. Well, she wasn't a stranger, she was born in Strasbourg, that's France, and there's a thumbprint as if she was a, uh, as if she'd done something wrong, as if she was a terrorist or something. She was only, in 1939, 1940, she was only six or seven. She could have been here today. I put in this picture to illustrate that even babies were sent away never to return. And in this case, the caption goes, name of the boy is Henri Finkelstein. He is born 30th of September, 1942 which means he's even younger than my younger brother at Paris, in Paris. Habité 18 rue de Tourville, he lived in 18 rue de Tourville, dans le 20e arrondissement. Deporté, convoi numéro 55, he was deported, convoy number 55, on the 23rd of June, 1943, and he was gassed when he arrived at Auschwitz. He definitely could have been here. This is a picture of Passage Brady, uh, taken by, uh, by my daughter. It was a bit rough then, it's even rougher now. This is Passage Brady. In those days, the shops along this passage, there were uh, dress shops, a lot of furriers. My father was a furrier. I once said, at one school I said, my father was a furrier, and when I had finished, the teacher said, Oi, if you say furrier, you better explain to them that a furrier is somebody who makes furs. Now, at this, uh, there are uh, Indian, Pakistani restaurants and hairdressers. This is a picture of my father and my mother, the only picture I have of my father. Looks like me, does he? No. The good looks run in the family. <laughs> and the baby, I must have been six months old. I think it's only, it's almost, I may have another picture of my mother, but I'm not quite certain. This is my baby brother, and may, I'm not quite certain when that was taken and by whom. This is number 90. Passage body, as you can see, not particularly, uh, not particularly nice, graffitied. <coughs> Olga. This is Olga Mazzoli who took me in in 1943. Uh, she was a bit of a character. She was a dancer at the Folie Bergère. Nobody's heard of the Folie Bergère. <laughs> uh, one or two have. It's a it's a laptop sort of place. It's a bit like a uh, Moulin Rouge. It's a sort of place where you don't take your children. <laughs> but she had this rather louche sort of lifestyle, but she was very kind. This is Olga and one of her boyfriends. Uh, a boyfriend that danced with her. And I've got a picture here. This is a picture that she gave me. And at the back, it, she has written, A mon petit Marcel chéri, to my darling Marcel chéri, pour qu'il ne, ne m'oublie pas, so he should never forget me. And as you can see, I haven't forgotten her. Very, very kind. Difficult woman, but very kind. <laughs> 
At boys' schools, I get whistling sometimes. <laughs> you don't like that. The only picture of Olga and me doing the war. But in those days, we didn't take selfies. <laughs> Very happy. As I was hidden, but I was happy. There's a good looking boy. <laughs> This is outside number 18 Rue Pouché, where Olga and Esther lived. But toward the end, uh, as she got older, she was left on her own. Her older sister died, and she really had very bad dementia. So she would have to stand outside in order to, for somebody to let her in, because she didn't know the combinations. She was, at the end, she was in a sad state. This is a picture, I am at the very front holding the, uh, the placard, Paris Annie Scolaire, and I don't look very happy, and I wonder whether it's because uh, I was aware of the fact that a few weeks later I would be taken over uh, to Manchester. This is a passport, my very first passport. Uh, I bring it with me. But it isn't a French passport, it's an Austrian passport. The reason, because my parents were illegal immigrants. And in, on the passport, the Austrian, I, when this ran out, I got a letter, and I've still got it, from the uh, Austrian government to say, we want our passport. But I decided, no, I'm going to keep it. <laughs> and I'm pleased, because I can read out page six, it says, permitted to land at Folkestone on the 15th of August, 1948, condition that the holder does not remain in the United Kingdom longer than six months. <laughs> and I'm still here. <laughs> this is the first letter. Sometimes, if I've got time, I read the letter, but we don't really have time here. But they're just a bit, uh, they're just halfway through. It says, je vous, uh, ici je, it says, ici je pleure quand je pense à toi. Here, I cry when I think of you. This is a letter I sent from Manchester back to Paris to Olga and Esther. Je ne voulais pas tout te dire. I didn't want to tell you, mais je te le dis. Je voudrais bien revenir chez nous. I would like to come home. Well, I never did come home the end of the letter. This is a memorial in Paris with a name of about 76, 77, 78 names of people who were taken away, who never came back. And outside this memorial building, there are uh, uh, copper, how would you call them? With the name of the people who saved, who were brave enough to take in Jewish people, Jewish children, and this is a memorial to these, uh, to these people. This was taken a few years ago. I will have to read this up. This is just outside the school that I went to when I lived with Olga and Esther Mazzoli, which is a school in Rue Pouchet. And this says, à la mémoire des élèves de cette école, to the memory of the children of this school, déportés de 1942-1944, parce que nés juifs, because they were born Jews, victimes innocentes de la barbarie nazie, innocent victims of the barbary, of the Nazi barbarism, avec la complicité, with the complicity the gouvernement de Vichy, or the Vichy government, the Vichy government being the French government, because the French government wasn't in Paris anymore, it was, it was in Vichy. Il fut exter exterminate, they were exterminated dans les camps de la mort, in the death camp, plus de 80 de ces enfants, more than 80 of these children, vivaient dans le 17e lived in the 17th arrondissement, which is where Rue Pouchet was in the 17th. 
and he finishes up by saying, ne les oublions jamais, let us never forget them. This says 80 children in this visit here, but I've seen uh, notices like this where there were 200, 300. Uh, in earlier they were, they were Jewish. This is a school, and these are the children, uh, the name of the children in their actual school. Uh, and you, as you can see, 14, 15, 8, all very young, who didn't survive. Propaganda. This is an underground station, Avru Komata, and this is uh, propaganda, and it shows a vulture with a star of David on its chest attacking Marianne, which represents France. And it says, Francais au secours, French people help. Very, very powerful propaganda. You couldn't miss that. And this is another placard amongst many, and it says, Il faut aussi balayer les Juifs. You've got to brush the Jews away. Pour que notre maison soit propre, so that our house should be clean. This is me, myself, when I was even better looking, <laughs> and my wife, and four of my grandchildren. The fifth one is the one that's at, Bir at Birmingham University. I just want to conclude my talk by explaining why I'm here, why I could be at home. Uh, the first reason is to remember my mother, a woman of 31, who had done nothing. She eventually had a breakdown, never recovered. She was treated very, very, very badly. She had uh, arthritis, she was ill, and I couldn't really communicate with her. And in spite of the fact that she was my biological mother, it never felt like it. Then, to remember Olga and Esther Mazzoli, two Catholic ladies who were extremely brave and took in a Jewish child, if the war had lasted any longer, they could have been taken away and they probably would not have survived. Uh, fortunately, uh, I was, uh, they did keep me and fortunately, toward the end of their lives, I returned when I was at university, I went back and visited them on a regular basis. Uh, and uh, eventually she died. And when she died, about maybe 15 years ago, there was nobody at her funeral except for my wife and I. She died alone, there was nobody. Then, also to remember, 11,400 Jewish children, French Jewish children, who had done nothing except for the fact that they had been born Jews. They were exterminated, uh, as well as a million, and a, uh, a million plus throughout Eastern Europe. And just finally, I just want to mention the importance I think this talk is. It's important as far as I'm concerned because it illustrates the dangers of racism. And as we all know, racism is here and racism has got to be uh, fought. And I have the impression, unfortunately, that that racism is not getting any better. I really should mention also that there was somebody or there are people called Holocaust deniers. They're saying it never happened. It never happened. So what happened to my father? What happened to my grandfather? My grandfather, a man in his mid-50s, he was taken to a concentration camp. He disappeared. My grandmother, a woman of 55, she disappeared. I don't know what happened to my grandmother and all the other people. So I'm afraid, or I, I, I am most emphatic, that the people who say it didn't happen, I'd like to know how they can explain a book with a thousand pictures of young children who were deported and never came back. Uh, and what I do mention when I talk to schools, although I don't think it's necessary here, is I emphasize to the school children in year nine or 10 the importance of 
okay, of not joining a gang, not joining uh, groups, and to follow their consciences, that is extremely important. To follow their conscience the way Olga and Esther Mazzoli did about 75 years ago. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for listening.